Now in this particular video, we're going to actually introduce the idea of quantum gates uh, through this uh, foundation uh, in classical computing. Now, classical logic gates, which I will write here, classical logic gates. Right, classical logic gates are something you may or may not already be familiar with. Um, just as a brief overview, let's begin by taking a look at this logic uh, that we have here. Now, classical logic may involve taking some sort of statement, for instance, we'll name the P and Q and saying, hey, you know, I can use the not operator on uh, these statements. Um, in this case, these statements either have true or false values. And when I apply the not operator, if the value is true, it becomes false. If the value is false, it becomes true. Now, another instance of a logic gate between our P and Q values would be say, hey, you know, what happens if I only want it to evaluate to be true when both of these values or all of my values are true? We can use the AND operator in this case, um, where it is true when both uh, statements here are essentially true and false otherwise. Um, there is a side note, there is also another operator known as NAND or N AND, right, where essentially it is the equivalent of taking the not of some AND statement. And what occurs here uh, is that we have a bit of an up arrow to represent uh, this particular operator. What occurs here is that if we're to take a look at the corresponding truth table here, we have P and if Q, we have P and AND, right, Q, and we have uh, true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. What occurs here is that this statement only evaluates to be true if our uh, AND statement is false. In this case, when both values are true, it's going to be false. And when both values are false, it's going to be true. And when one of these values are is false, right, and the other is true, it's also going to evaluate to be true in this case. And that's just the N and, and operator that we have on hand. Now, going on from there, there's also this idea that what happens if we only need one of our particular statements to be, valid, be true, or one or both, um, in this case, for the overall statement to be true, and that is our OR operator, right? Um, and then, of course, if you only want one or the other, either P or Q, but not both, um, to evaluate uh, to be true in order for this overall statement to be true, we have an exclusive OR, exclusive OR here. And so essentially, these are our primary uh, logic operators. And these operators, again, allow us one to make some change to the overall defined value of our statements here. And two, also define relationships between our overall statements. Now, the question is, how does this relate to classical computers? We define this as a part of uh, a major part of classical logic gates. Now, what occurred here is that some uh, uh, wonderful uh, individual named by the name of Claude Shannon actually, would, while working towards his master's degree, was able to recognize that logic and these logic operators could also be represented using electricity in circuits. Now the question is, why, why does this matter? Because the main idea here is that these gates will allow us to draw some sort of information and relationship and actually create some change in the values between uh, the hardware and the information from the hardware and when we go and try to process it using software. And so it creates that connection. Now these logic gates um, here for our classical computers, right, um, as Shannon essentially proposed would correspond to values uh, in electricity. And so the idea within a given circuit of some sort, if you have a, a battery, right, and you have a circuit that goes all the way around, perhaps you have a bit of a, like, a light bulb here, for instance, if you have some gates, um, perhaps uh, here, the idea is that at some given point in time, there's either electricity or there's not electricity trying to pass through a certain point in the wire. And we will define the times where the electricity is passing through, where there is a, a current essentially going through as when the value is true. And we'll define times when there is no electric current or when there is not a, a certain pulse of electricity that is traveling through the wire at that point as false. So when there is a pulse, and here is no pulse. All right, and now we have defined our true and false values. Now, what you see on the screen here is essentially a short table kind of of our primary logic gates. And oftentimes, if you do end up working, for instance, in electrical engineering, you will see these occasionally show up to define uh, what occurs um, when uh, a certain point uh, in a given circuit. Right? You can see the inputs in this case, input and input. So our inputs, right? will allow us uh, to kind of define these relationships, see what's happening, and whether when there's an electric pulse and when there's not, what occurs in, under those circumstances. 
Now you will note actually that we can take a look at these logic gates and these logic operators and fundamentally define them also to be functions. In this case for and, or, and, 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 or, xor, uh, not, uh, nor, a kind of statements here, right? Most of these uh, being a combination of our primary uh, our primary uh, operators in this case, right, you'll see that most of them have maybe like two inputs um, or, or perhaps more, um, but for the most part, most of them have two inputs. Now, it is worth noting um, that in this case, we can see that each time we put an input, it creates an output of some sort, and you actually can define these as being a, a sort of function in this case. Um, you will know actually for our not operator in this case, it's a bit of a, a one input, one output kind of situation in this case. Now, when we have a true a true value, when there is indeed an electric pulse, we can also define that as being equal to a one in your particular computer bit. On the other hand, if we have a false value, right, when there is no electric pulse at that moment, uh, we can define that as being equivalent to a zero value in our particular bits. And doing so will actually allow us to, at just the very low lowest level, uh, kind of. Uh, it essentially define what is occurring with our computations, what is occurring uh, when we attempt to, for instance, add something using a computer program. We attempt to perform a subtraction operator uh, within a computer program or multiplication or division. This is what it looks like at the most basic level and allows us to compute things uh, using our bits, uh, bit operations in a sense. Now, the question here is how does this all translate over to quantum computing? And the answer is because this idea of manipulating these values is essentially the equivalent to the idea of manipulating values in quantum computers, and more specifically, manipulating the values of qubits. Now, you may already be familiar with this problem where we have, uh, for instance, two individuals. We have Alice and we have Bob over here. And they, they are perhaps sitting next to each other. There's some distance from each other. And they want to send a message to one another using a qubit of some sort. And so Alice measures her qubit in some direction. She perhaps measures it uh, in the up and down direction. So she takes her qubit and then she sends it over to Bob. And Bob measures his he, the qubit he receives in some arbitrary direction. Uh, for instance, he may measure at the 45 uh, and then sorry, 215 uh, angle or perhaps you know to the left and right or the zero end. Uh, 180 degree uh, directions, right? In either case, he measures his the qubit he receives in a slightly different direction. As a result, the orthonormal bases used to represent it can be slightly different. Now, what we are saying from this perspective is saying, hey, Alice measures hers in some direction, and when the cube is received, the uh, direction in which Bob measures it can be changed, and it's uh, kind of altered a little bit. Now, analogously, it, it, this is interesting because it's based upon perspective. We're seeing it as though the spin of the qubit still uh, in which Alice's was measured uh, essentially remains the same and it is Bob's direction of measurement that is changing. However, it is worth noting that we can also say this is equivalent to saying that Alice uh, sends her qubit over, and I apologize, this is a badly drawn uh, stick figure. She sends her qubit over, but somewhere in this process of transmission, the qubit gets turned a little bit, so that maybe the qubit gets turned on its side, so that the, the direction of measurement uh, has been altered during this moment of transmission. And when Bob receives it, he still measures it in the same direction. He also measures it in the up and down direction, but relative to the qubit, all of a sudden, the initial spin direction uh, in which it was measured has changed. Now, this may seem a little bit confusing at a bit of a surface level, so let's use a slightly different analogy. Let's say you are sitting, for instance, in a car next to a train, or actually, let's use both trains. So you are sitting in a train of some sort. So you, in a lovely train, let's say this is a train seat here. Right? And when you're sitting in that particular train, you look out the window and you see right next to your window, there is a second train, a second train out here second train right? and it's so large and so close that you're just mere inches away and so you can only see the window of the other train now as soon as one of your two trains starts moving there is a maybe a split second perhaps and you may have experienced this at some point in time where you're unsure whether it's the second train or whether it is you your train that is moving and the reason is because you are unsure and you've lost a bit of a frame of reference in that case right it may be that when the train is moving forward at 50 miles per hour relative to you you're unsure whether it's you that is staying still and the second train is moving forward at 50 miles per hour, whether it's that a second train that is staying still and you are actually moving in a different direction uh, at 50 miles per hour. 
Um, so in general, it is extremely important to find this frame of reference. And so going back to our idea and our question of the qubit here, right, we're asked and essentially asked to say, hey, when we measure this qubit, has this qubit been turned? Has its initial direction of measurement been changed a little bit relative to us? Where our uh, measure, uh, direction of measurement and, uh, for instance, Alice's direction of measurement, or Bob and Alice's direction of measurement, directions of measurement are actually in the same direction, pointing in the same way, both up and both measuring a spin direction up and asking this qubit the same question. But where the qubit itself has spun a little bit, has turned a little bit during this moment of transmission. And so in order to achieve this idea of having the qubit spin kind of change a little bit where its initial uh, relative uh, direction of measurement has altered during this transmission method, uh, this period, is, is can be achieved using quantum gates. And these quantum gates, quantum gates, allows us fundamentally to assume that the direction of measurement is fixed. Direction of measurement is fixed. And during this transmission, time. So during transmission, the qubit has been rotated. Rotated. And the tool we used to rotate and perform this rotation is and corresponds essentially to our quantum gates. And this essentially introduces this idea for quantum gates. And it also allows us to account for, for instance, certain changes in, uh, for instance, for example, I'm sorry, uh, the direction of measurement or unknowns in that particular direction, but also allows us to question and consider properties of the qubit as well as perform operations on it. And these operations will allow us to translate changes in the hardware um, all the way up uh, to the software and allow us to perform the calculations and implement the algorithms in order to do what we initially set out to do, which is perform some sort of computation of some sort. And all right, that is essentially a brief introduction to quantum gates, just conceptually taking a look, uh, an overview of what they are and introducing the idea via uh, classical uh, gates and classical logic. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and check uh, the community tech website. And as always, stay curious and keep on learning. Thank you.